copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Alameda County Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all sheriff's cars. Broadcast 207. Regarding a murder at 795 Pinedale Court in Hayward. That's all. Rolls and clips. When 150 of the world's leading child specialists praised the scientific methods used by Dr. Defoe and his staff in caring for the Dion quintuples, it is little wonder that many of you parents follow the same formula in caring for your own children. It is natural for us to profit by the experience of others when that experience is crowned with success. And so it is easy to understand why so many thousands of you motorists have followed the lead of the most noted gasoline specialists to recommend and use Rio Grande cracked gasoline. These men, the drivers of your police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and other emergency public service cars, chose Rio Grande cracked over all other gasoline for its quicker starting, steadier acceleration, longer mileage, greater reserve power, and higher speed capacity. Their continued and exclusive use of Rio Grande Crack is based upon 55 million miles of experience during a single 12-month period. Profit by the valuable experience of those who drive the most in the heart. Wheel in to your nearest Rio Grande station tomorrow morning and begin getting police car performance in your own car with Rio Grande Crack, the gasoline that is preferred by thinking motorists throughout the West. Inasmuch as the story we are to hear tonight was taken from the confidential files of the Alameda County Sheriff's Office, we have asked Sheriff M.B. Driver of Alameda County to open our program. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In this series of programs, Rio Grande in its law enforcement work has constantly played in one key, the failure of crime to be a paying proposition. If an individual contemplating a crime, no matter what the motive, could know what every law enforcement officer knows, we would have no crime problem. The lawbreaker, in his fine opinion of himself, thinks that he can pit his wits against the experience of a host of officers. Such a man lacks intelligence. If he was intelligent, he wouldn't think that way. For a moment's calm consideration of the situation will tell him that his crime won't pay. I hope that this broadcast, like others in our sponsor's history, will prove the futility of crime. Take it from me, you can't get away with it. The scream of a siren knifed through the din of a driving rainstorm as Deputy Sheriff Douglas Webb and Grover Mull sped through the gathering night. Knocked off this time, Grover. Nobody yet. Carl Daniels out in Hayward has been shot. Not expected to live. Who shot him? Nobody knows. Not even Daniels? No. Where was the rest of the family? Out all day. How did it happen? Well, the old man came in and found a masked man in the house. Get a good look at him? I don't know. Daniels is still unconscious. Prowler? Maybe, maybe not. Now watch that truck. Doesn't make sense for an ordinary prowler to shoot a man down in his own house. They usually beat it out a back door. This guy left by the front. Now, where'd you get all the dope? All over the telephone. The killer must be either an amateur or a maniac. Or else... Uh... Or else is right. Where did the old man live? Oh, with his daughter and son-in-law in Hayward. Prominent citizen out here. Yeah, I know it. I've known him for years. Well, maybe this case will give you a chance for that <laughs> photographic hobby of yours. I hope so. I don't like for a case to break too easy. Waking street lights through the rain drenched town into the sparsely settled countryside by lonely farmhouses flew the police car. Iron blasting the storm tortured night. All the fury of fast motion, the rain ripping at the windshield, throbbing motor, whining free. 
and screaming sirens blended into a fiendish symphony of trouble and impending terror. At last, the car swung into a gravel roadway and slid to a stop in front of a house in Pinedale Court. Journey's in, my lad. Huh. All the lights in the place on from the look of it. Ominously quiet otherwise. Which marks you as deaf or unobservant. Hear that radio? Huh, that's odd, isn't it? Very. Let's go in. Are you in the habit of walking in blood? What? Take a look at the floor. Oh, something ought to be done about that. Oh, thank God you've come. We've been nearly crazy since we heard of Father's shooting. Uh, what's, uh, what's your name, please? Uh, I'm Mrs. Mitchell. Mr. Daniel's daughter. This is my husband. Oh, please sit down. Dear. Where's your father? He's been taken to the hospital. When did you find out about this? When we got home a few minutes ago. Dr. Struble was here. Who's he? Well, he's our next-door neighbor. He gave my father-in-law first aid and sent him to the hospital. What hospital? The Hayward Sanitarium. Do you mind if I shut this radio off? No, 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 of course not. Quiet without that thing. Uh, Now, Mrs. Mitchell, please tell us exactly what happened. Well, there isn't very much I can tell. We got home about 20 minutes ago. That is, Everett and I. We were surprised to find the front door partly open. And we thought that maybe Father had left it that way. He walked in and stepped right into that that awful pool of blood. Oh, please, please, can't you make us as brief as possible, gentlemen? My wife's under an awful strain. Yes, we can see that. Well, she can't stand very much questioning. Yeah, that's plain. Neither one of us knows very much about this crime. But after we got home, Dr. Struble came over and told us about it. Uh, how did this doctor find out about it? Well, he said Father staggered into his house. He'd been shot in the abdomen, but he managed to gasp out that he'd been shot by a masked man. Here, in the hallway? Yes. And then, evidently, the man had been waiting for him. Did your father-in-law have any enemies that you know of? None that I know anything about. Was your father, father-in-law out most of the day? Well, yes, he'd just returned. From what Dr. Struble told us, father didn't know the man and couldn't give any reason for the attack. Have you been to the hospital yet? Uh, no. We would have gone right over there, but we knew you officers would be here in a little while, and... Well, we wanted to be here when you came. And you don't know of any enemies he might have had? Well, no. Oh, he was the kindest and gentlest man I ever knew. Oh, well, there isn't a person living who would have hurt him. And yet somebody did. Uh, have you looked to see if any valuables are missing? Well, no, we haven't. Oh, well, my wife is too much upset. Oh, by the way, can I remove that blood? Oh, yes, yeah, surely. But don't disturb anything else. Oh, I'd like to clean that rug, too, if I may. Yes, go ahead. No, no, i better leave that. We'll... Be wanting to take that to headquarters. Well, keep these people busy while I look around outside. Okay. With the suddenness characteristic of a California rain, the storm had lulled. A gibbous moon shouldered over Grizzly Peak as Deputy Mull, flashlight in hand, prepared to survey the scene. Banana trees waved their monstrous leaves like shrouds for the dead. Tall palms rustled and chuckled in a ribald cackle of diabolic glee. With his flashlight, Mull traced the almost washed out trail of blood over the sinister track the wounded man had followed. At the corner of the steps leading to the Mitchell home, Mull discovered a footprint. He was preparing to remove the turf when a police car pulled to the curb. What's doing, Mull? I just found what looks like a fairly good footprint. I got a call on this a few minutes ago. Figured it's about time the chief of police got on the job. So far, we've found absolutely nothing in the case except this footprint. Now, yeah, let's have a look at it. There it is, right there by that bush. Hmm. Must have been a fairly large man. And evidently in a hurry. Yeah, must have been, judging by the distance this print is from the steps. So far, that footprint and a bloody rug are the people's exhibits in this case. Shine your light down here a minute, will you? Yeah, it's a pretty clear print. Hmm. Grover, take a look at this. What's wrong? Nothing. See that little lump of mud? Yeah, but there's lots of mud in that print. Yeah, but take this magnifying glass and have a close look. That lump right there. That was on the man's foot before he came to this house. How do you know? Well, you'll notice there isn't another piece of mud around here exactly like that one on the print. Uh, what's different about this one? You see those tiny reddish particles in there? They're iron or some other metallic substance. Yeah, I do see them now. They sort of gleam under the light. The way I doped this out is that the killer picked this mud up in some other part of town. It clung to his shoe right where the heel joins the sole, and when he jumped down here, it was jarred loose. Well, it does fit that position in the footprint. It may sound fantastic, but 
I have an idea that if we find where that mud came from, we'll know a lot more about who shot Daniels. Boy, that's doping it out to a fine point. Well, it's not as impossible as it sounds. <laughs> not much. No, it isn't. My men know every inch of this town. We'll simply search till we find the spot that matches this specimen. Just like that, huh? Yeah. And when we've found it, we'll investigate every house and person in that neighborhood till we find somebody who's seen the man who made that print. You know, you can think of the hardest job. Well, there's no telling what we'll uncover. Well, we'll just take this little dab of mud, put it in this envelope, and take it with us. Well, anyway, I think I'll dig this print up and take it in and have the boys make a moulage of it. Oh, and uh, I think it might be a good idea to try young Mitchell's shoes in that print, too. And Daniel's, for that matter. <laughs> footprint was checked against every possible shoe that could have made it, yet no one was found who had been near the house on the fateful night. Every resident of Pinedale Court was questioned, but no one had seen or heard anything out of the ordinary. Next morning, Webb and Mull meet to compare notes on the investigation. Webb, I have thought about this case all night. I have got an uncanny feeling that we've overlooked a bet someplace. Not that I want to appear repetitious, but so have I. I refuse to believe in an absolutely clueless crime. What do you mean, clueless? Oh, there's a clue somewhere, if we can only find it. How do you figure this one is clueless? There's the footprint and that speck of mud. Oh, I'm not forgetting that, but that footprint is good only as circumstantial evidence after we get our man. But how about that mud? Well, yeah, between you and me, Doug, it's a thousand to one shot that Chief Silva or his men will never find the place it came from. No, I got a feeling we've overlooked something that's vital, yet it's so obvious that we haven't noticed it. Why don't we go out and check over the place again? Wait a minute. I got it. Got what? Remember that radio? What about it? Well, when we started talking to Mrs. Mitchell, she reached over and turned it off. Remember? Now that you recall it, I do. Doesn't that strike you as a false note? How? Why should the radio have been playing at all? By George, you're right. Remember, they, they say they had just arrived... And when they came in... They found the place open and blood on the floor. Yeah. It's not very likely that under those circumstances they'd turn on the radio, is it? Not very. Of course, people do strange things under the stress of emotion, but I doubt very much whether they'd tune in a jazz program. Uh, maybe Daniel... No, he couldn't have. According to the story he told Dr. Struble, he was shot immediately after stepping into the house. He wouldn't have stopped to turn on the radio after that. No, not very likely. His main idea was to get help. You're right. Now, let's shoot out there and look into this. <laughs> Mr. Mitchell, we're checking every angle on this shooting. It just occurred to us that there was something a little strange about that radio playing at your house last night. Radio? Hey, that's right. But that radio wasn't working yesterday morning. What? Wasn't working. Why, we heard it playing last night. Oh, I know it. I remember my wife shutting it off. We didn't notice it at the time, but, but that radio's been broken for about three days. Are you sure of that? Well, I'm positive. I remember wanting to hear a news broadcast yesterday morning, and my wife reminded me that I'd forgotten to call the repairman. We were going to send it to the shop today. Yet it was playing perfectly last night. You're sure your wife didn't uh, have a man repair the radio? Oh, I'm very sure. As a matter of fact, we talked about it on the way home last night. Well, since you and your wife weren't home, it was obviously impossible for you to turn it on. It doesn't seem very likely that your father-in-law did. That leaves only the gunman. And that's fantastic. Oh, maybe, but it's the best theory we've got right now. Uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Mitchell, did you find any articles missing from the house? Oh, yes. Uh, several pieces of silver are gone, and some old jewelry we kept upstairs in Father's bedroom. I think we'd better take a look at that radio. Let's see if it works now. Working now, all right. Wait, we'll see. It takes a little time to heat up. You ought to have one like them in the movies. Well, that settles it. Here's where I get busy with that fingerprint camera. You fix yourself out a real job this time. Don't worry. If they're here, I'll get them. Yeah, you'll probably find plenty of them. Well, how can you tell which are the new ones? You can't. Well, then how is finding prints on the radio going to help catch the man who shot my father-in-law? That's a job for Harnden, our identification expert. <laughs> Under Harnden's direction, a check was made of every radio salesman and repairman who might have handled the interior parts of the radio. All of them were possible suspects, but one by one, each was eliminated. Meanwhile, the work of Chief of Police Silver and his men was going on in another part of town. 
Then, on the fifth day after the shooting, Carl Daniels died. Slowly, remorselessly, the net of the law tightened around the player. Hello, Silva. I came over as soon as I got your call. What new? Well, Mole, I've got a description of your phantom gunman. What? That's right. Did you get us from that piece of mud? That's right, too. But how? Well, we went over this town practically inch by inch. Finally, we found the same kind of earth in a gully out on the edge of town. We went over every square inch of that gully. Good Lord, man, that's an awful amount of work. Oh, we don't worry about that when it's necessary to trap a killer. What else did you find? Well, at one point in the gully, we found what was left of a lunch. You know, eggshells, pieces of bread, a water-soaked newspaper. Yeah, handout, huh? That's what we figured. Now, that lunch must have been put up by some housewife. There was a penciled notation of some sort on the margin of the newspaper. My men now checking every house in the neighborhood, trying to find the house where that lunch came from. Well, but there are 50, 600 homes in this town. Okay, we'll check them all. Did we find where that lunch in that newspaper came from? Chief Silver speaking. Yeah? All right, I'll be right out. That was Mac. He found the woman who put up that lunch, Mrs. Rowland. What a break. Wait a minute. Let's take a run down and see if Harnden's got anything definite on those prints. Maybe we can get something for this woman to identify. Well, Harnden, what have you found out about those prints in the Daniels case? I've eliminated five of them. The sixth belongs to a man named Reed. Here's his card. Oh, we're getting hot, Louie. Hmm. Joseph M. Reed, alias Rogers and Davis, San Quentin, 1923. Assault with deadly weapon, served six years. Released 1929. Got a picture of this bird, Harlan? Yeah, right here. A mud picture. Hmm. Mrs. Rowland ought to be able to identify that. If that's our man. He'll have a hard time explaining how his fingerprints got on Mitchell's radio if he isn't our man. Well, by the way, did you list that stolen silver and jewelry with a pawn shop? Yeah, with every shop in the Bay region. Good. That'll help. Let's show this stuff to Mrs. Rowland and see what she says. Mrs. Rowland, we're trying to get a line on the man who shot Carl Daniels. One of my men reports that you've recognized this newspaper as one you wrapped a lunch in a few days ago. Yes, that's the paper, all right. I remember that man coming to the back door here, asking for something to eat. That was the day Mr. Daniels was shot. I remember the rain. It was raining at the time, as a matter of fact. Do you remember what the man looked like? Well, he wasn't a very big man. About your size, I think. He was rather dark. He had a little mustache. He was rather short. He had very deep lines at the corners of his mouth and between his eyes. Uh, is this picture anything like the man? Why, it's the same man. Are you sure of that? Well, I'm positive. I'll never forget just how that man looked. His right ear stood out a little, just as it does right there in the picture. Miss Roland, we want you to be certain about this. Oh, I'm very certain. That's a picture of the man I gave the lunch to, all right. You remember which way he went after you gave the lunch to him? Yes, he went down toward that little creek or that gully down there in the next block. Well, thank you, Mrs. Roland. Oh, uh, we may have to call you again if we get this man. We need a personal identification. Well, that's all right. I'll be glad to identify him any time I see him again. Well, Grover, looks like we're getting hotter. Yeah, it looks that way, but I still don't get the motive for the crime. Well, I haven't any doubt about Reed doing the job, though. Have you? No, but there are a lot of things unexplained. That radio, for instance. Well, it's got me, too. I can't figure that one out. I'm going down to the office to check up on this Reed guy a little further. Three months go by. Officers continue to be on the lookout for the slayer of Carl Daniels. Then, one rainy afternoon, exactly three months to the day from the time of the murder, the telephone in the office of Deputy Mull shrieks a sinister alarm. Sheriff's office, Mull speaking. There's a fellow down here trying to sell some of the things you described to me. Those things that were stolen from the Daniels' place. Keep them there by some hook or crook. I'll be right down. Hurry, Sheriff. Hey, what are you trying to do? Hit me? 
It's just worth ten times your amount. Five dollars is all I could give you. No more than my own mother. Why, you little runt. I ought to have poked you in the nose. So go ahead. I still wouldn't give you any more than five dollars. That's about enough, Reed. Come along with me. For you. Sheriff's office. Try and make me, copper. Oh, my showcase, my unbreakable showcase. Keep down, keep down. Somebody's hiding behind it. that trash can on the sidewalk. Keep out of sight. A person's on the other. My, 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 my fine plate glass window. Stop him. That ought to be all he's got. All right, Reed. Get him up. You wouldn't have got me, copper, if I'd have had any more bullets. Yeah, maybe not. Come on, you mug. That'll hold you for a while. Hello, Webb. Where were you during the excitement? Out on another call. Who's your friend? This is Joe Reed, the gentleman we strongly suspect of killing Carl Daniels. He also tried to put a few slugs into me. How about it, Reed? Ah, uh, what's the use? Sure, I killed him. Why? Mm. I don't know. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Suppose, uh, suppose you tell us about it. Of course, we're going to use anything you say against her. You know that. Yeah, sure. Are you the man Mrs. Rowland gave the hand out to? Yeah. Yeah, I was broke. I went by a place was going to break in and see what I could find, but she was home. So I just asked her for a handout. What, uh, what did you do then? Went down the gully and that what she gave me. What were you doing in Hayward in the first place? Uh, I always worked a little time. You can get into places easy, and with folks at home, you can usually get something to eat. How did you happen to get into the Mitchell place? Uh, it, was, it was just an accident. I didn't pick it for no special reason. just started working at the corner. I was going to work my way along the block. How did you get in? I used a skeleton key on the side door. Did you turn on that radio? Sure, sure. I always do that. It makes the neighbors think the folks is home. They aren't suspecting nothing. But the Mitchell radio was out of order. Sure. But I fixed it. I used to fix radios in Quentin. I learned it there. How come we didn't find any fingerprints except on the radio? I always wear gloves when I work. It keeps my hands clean. I had to take them off when I fixed the radio, though. That was a mistake. Yeah, I know that now. How did you happen to shoot, Daniel? Well, I I was upstairs going to the dresser drawers, and I looked out, and I see this fella coming up the walk. I run downstairs, and when he come in the front door, I let him have it. But why? I don't know. I guess I get excited too easy. Uh, what did you do after you got away? I went over to Frisco and got me a room. I give the jewelry to my girlfriend, Conchita. But she tried to two-time me, and I took it away from her. And tried to sell it to Sally, huh? Sure. I needed a dough. Well, where's this girlfriend now? Uh, she went down to Mexico City. Some bird stabbed her one night. Now listen to me, Conchita. I tell you many times, I will not stand for you being with Pablo. Who do you think you are to be telling me who I can go with and who I cannot? Just the same, I am telling you. And you are going to do as I say. Listen. I sent better men than you are to jail in this state. <laughs> See, I know what you mean, I suppose. Like your boyfriend, Reed, eh? Don't say anything about him. At least he was right. He's more than you are. Ah, uh, to cochina de Casiara. Stop it. You're choking me. Uh, isn't that too bad? Uh, what do you think I'm trying to do? Uh, please, Pancho. Don't do that. Uh. Uh. All right. But remember... Next time, I won't let you off so easy. I remember. Uh, where is all that jewelry you said this Reed gave you? He took it away from me. Don't lie to me. I told you when you went to San Francisco not to come back without money. Or something I could get money with. I am not lying, Pancho. You did take this stuff away from me. That is why I come back. Uh, you came back. What good are you to me unless you bring me money? <laughs> Is that all I mean to you, Pancho? Why not? What else? But I love you, Pancho. Love from you? Oh, but it is <laughs> true, Panchito. I go anywhere with you. I do anything for you. Get away from me. <laughs> oh, you hit me for the last time, Pancho. Hey, put down the knife. Put it down. No. Put it down. No. I am going to kill you. I'm going to kill you, do you hear me? You try to kill Pancho, eh? You try to kill him, eh? You try to kill him, eh? Tell me something. 
How come you guys was looking for me? I didn't leave no traces of my work except the radio. Well, we got some pretty good prints off of that radio, and Chief Silver's men traced you by the mud you left in that footprint in front of the Mitchell house. Chief, I never thought of that. I knowed my old lady was right. She always told me to wipe the mud off in my feet. are guilty of treason on the highways in that they contribute to the delinquency of your motor. That kind of crime does not pay either. This advertising world is filled with extravagant claims and glowing promises, but you can't fool all the people all the time. As a matter of fact, you can't fool the truly motor-wise any of the time. The officials of 30 leading cities and counties throughout California know what they are doing when after putting all motor fuels through their paces, they issue orders that only Rio Grande cracked gasoline shall be used to power their emergency equipment. They were looking for a gasoline that would deliver maximum performance at a minimum expenditure of the taxpayer's money, and they found it in Rio Grande Crack. We do not ask that you take our word for it. We do believe that the experience of these officials is an eloquent, unsolicited, and unpaid-for testimonial that should convince every prudent motorist to find out for himself. Do this very thing tomorrow morning. Drop in at the nearest Rio Grande station. Fill up with Rio Grande cracked gasoline, and you will discover the meaning of real police car performance. received a life sentence in San Quentin, where he is now incarcerated. Thus ended a case that was a mixture of modern criminological science and old-time tried and true police methods. And thus is added to the records another crime that did not pay. Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all sheriff's cars. A cancellation of broadcast 207 regarding a murder. Suspects in this case are now in custody. That's all. Rolls and quits. Frederick Lindsley bidding you good night for Rio Grande.